three, two, one, bro. Hi, everybody. Welcome to What's on That Shelf, where we go through our shelves, those ones right there, talk about the games that are on them, give a brief synopsis, which is a fun word to say. Uh, we just talk about the game real quick and just give it, give a little tidbit about what the game's about. We're going to be talking about this shelf right here today. So, let's go ahead and get into it. What's the first one? Herbaceous. Great game. That's it. No, Herbaceous. Herbaceous is a great, great little game um, that we got that really surprised me with how much I love it. This has kind of become one of my go-to gateway filler games. Like if you want to bring out a game that's small, that everyone can understand, this is a really, really great one. Herbace is a game where there are going to be a bunch of different herbs or herbs if you're American or herbs if you're British. Um, there's going to be a bunch of herbs in the middle of the, of the table or rather Basically, you're drawing cards, and there's gonna be like saffron and sage and and rosemary and bay and all these different kind of herbs, and you will have your own private little herb garden and a couple different pots that you can put the herbs into, little potted plants area. It's very nice, and then there's gonna be like a public garden which will be out in the middle of the board. So basically, you're gonna draw a card. It's gonna be an herb. Let's just say it's saffron, and then you basically have to decide right then and there: do you want to put it in your private garden or do you want to put it in your public or in the public garden? Now, if you put it in the private garden, that herb is yours. No one can take it. No one can do anything to it. But the reason why you're like, well, why would you put, always put it in your private garden? Well, it's because you draw a card, you choose which garden to put it in, and then you have to draw another card. And whatever garden you didn't choose to put it in, the first card you drew, you have to put this second card in that garden. So you will always put a card in your private garden and a, gar a card in the public garden. So if you draw it now, you're like, ooh. I don't really need this in my private garden. I'm gonna put it in the public garden and then hopefully I blind draw something that I need into my private garden. And essentially you are then going to have the opportunity to pot some of these um, herbs. And so there are four different kinds of pots and they essentially do different things. There's one pot where you want the same herbs. You want, you want all of the same herbs. So you want like six different saffron cards and then you pot it in that pot and you're good. There's one where you want all of them are different. And there's ones where you want pears. You want a pair of bay, a pair of rosemary, a pair of saffron, as many pears as you can get. And then there's one kind of special pot. The thing about the pots is you can only pot herbs into a pot once. So once you put like four saffron into the one where you want all the same, you can never ever add any herbs to that pot ever again. So you have to wait to do it. And on top of that, when you decide to pot stuff, you can pot stuff from your private and the public garden. So if you see I have three saffron and there are three out there, you're like, ooh, should I wait? Should I, should I pot these now? Because there's six. Or should I wait and hopefully try to get one more? You're like, I could do it. I'm going to wait. And then you wait. It goes to the next person. They go, okay, I'm going to pot these three saffron. You're like, damn it. And, and that kind of stuff happens all the time. And it's really, really fun. It's got beautiful, beautiful art by Beth Sobel. It's just a delightful little game. Um, it's really, really fun. Really small. Great. Goes well. It's just, it's outstanding. Herbaceous is a wonderful, mwah, wonderful, wonderful game. Next up, oh, you got I'll try and keep these ones quick. It won't go quick. It's gonna be like a 30 minute video, let's be honest. Um, because there's like five more games here. World's Fair, 1893. This is probably at this point my favorite, um, favorite area control game, I would say. Um, I really, really, really love World's Fair 1893. This is a game by Renegade Games and Foxtrot Games. Um, and it's basically a game where there is going to be a Ferris, the big Ferris wheel, and then different parts of the World Fair of 1893, which is the one that was in Chicago, where some bunch of people got murdered by somebody. Devil in the White City, that book, it's about the World's Fair. Someone got, a bunch of people got murdered. Basically, there's a bunch of different categories. There's like manufacturing, there's like electricity, there's the arts, there's all these different areas of the fair. And essentially, you're putting your supporters, which are just cubes, in the different parts of the fair, and you're trying to collect cards. And the cards will be um, different colored cards that have to go with the different types. So there's like red cards that go with the red area, green cards that go with the green area, stuff like that. Um, and you're collecting these cards, and then there are also these brown cards, which are special people at the fair, people who are uh, big scientists or big people like that, and they essentially allow you to do different special actions, they allow you to add other followers, you can then move your followers around, they essentially allow you to come in, kind of manipulate and mitigate things. And it's really, really fun, and then at the end of the round, 
basically whoever has majority in all the different areas. So whoever has majority in like the manufacturing area, they then, I think manufacturing is uh, gray. Let's just say it's gray. Or let's go with yellow. Yellow is electricity. I know that for a fact because I just saw it on the back of the box. Um, yellow is electricity. Whoever has a majority in electricity, they then get to turn in some of the yellow cards they have into these tokens. And at the end of the game, you want sets of tokens. It's ultimately a set collection game. And so if you have a set of five different tokens as the five different parts of the fair, you can get like 15 points, but then you can start like a second set and a third set. So you're essentially trying to get majority of these areas so you can turn in these cards to get these tokens, to get set collection, to get points at the end of the game. And that's pretty much the game. It's ultimately pretty simple, but it plays really, really fast. It's area control, but it doesn't feel really mean despite the fact that it's kind of cutthroat. Um, and it's just really, really cool. And on top of that, it's a really cool theme. I love World's Fair as a theme. We just got Crystal Palace recently, and I love the World's Fair as a theme in general. I think it's really, really fun. And the cool thing is, is all the cards, you can see here's a Bertha Palmer here, if you can see that. And then this right here is one of the arts, which is one of the red ones, and this is the Republic. And then each different card, like all these Midway cards, all the cards, have different information on them, like stuff that was actually at the fair. So like this card, the Republic, is about the Republic. There are ones about art, there's ones about electricity, all these different things, and it actually tells you information about it. But the thing is, the game is really, really fast, so you never ever get to read any of these cards, but the cards are actually really, really fascinating. So it's one of those kind of weird like side effects where it's like, it's such an interesting game that ultimately has so much depth in terms of the theme that you never get to see because the game is actually really, really quick. It also scales really well. I really, really love World's Fair 1893. Give it a shot if you like um, area control games or even if you don't because area control is not anywhere near one of my favorite um, uh, me mechanisms and I really like this one a lot. So World's Fair 1893 by Renegade and Fox Trot is a wonderful, wonderful game. Cruising, not really, we're probably like 10 minutes in. Crown of Amara. This is a new game uh, that we got. It's not a new game completely, but um, Crown of Amara is a game that I got for my birthday. Our, our good friend Crookie Brookie uh, gives us usually games for our birthdays, and he gave us Cole Baron, which is over there um, last year, and then this year he gave me Crown of Amara. And this is a game that came out last year that kind of flew under the radar, but this is a big, it's just like, it's just dry Euro garbage. And I mean that in the best possible, possible way. And, and trust me, that's a compliment coming from me. I love... Dry Euro garbage. I love it. I wish I didn't. I wish I, I wish I only liked super cool thematic games, but I don't. I do love dry Euros. I love thematic Euros more, but I also just love dry Euros. So me saying this is dry Euro garbage, that's about the highest praise I can possibly give um, a game. <laughs> and so this game is uh, a game where you're just, you're, you're becoming the crown of Amara, whatever the hell that means. It's about nobility and all that kind of stuff. But essentially, there are two sides of the board. There's like the countryside and then there's the city. And you have a counselor on each side of the board. And then on your turn, you're playing out these cards. And these cards will essentially, one, give you an action. Or they may give you a resource. But then they also have, a, depending on where you put them on your board, your little player board, you will then get to move one of your counselors either one, um, two, or three spaces. So your counselor can is, say it's on this spot. They can go like one, two, three and then they will do the action there. And then the countryside gives you resources and then you'll spend those resources over here in the city, same thing. When you move your counselor, you can move your counselor in the city or your counselor in the countryside. And so you're trying to play your cards in the different slots to get your counselors where you want them to do, where you want them so you can get the different um, resources and to get to the space where you can spend those resources well. Um, and it's got two different scoring. There's like nobility points, which are just points, and then there's um, building points. And at the end of the game, whichever is the lower of those two scores, that's your score for the game. So the other one, the higher one, doesn't count at all. So basically what you want is you want your two scores to be exactly the same because then they're both your lower or they're both your higher in that case, and you probably did pretty well. And this is a game where, I, one of those games where I was reading the rule book and all of a sudden I was just like, oh yes, this is gonna be, this is gonna be amazing. And it is. I really, really like it. I like it a lot. I think this game is going to climb for me. I think the Secret Cabal guys really like it a lot as well. But Crown of Amara is, it, despite such a boring cover and, and just a boring theme, I love it. It's just dry hero garbage and I love it. I really do. Um, it's really, really outstanding. It's, it's incredible. If you like Euro games, um, the programming of your movement is super, super interesting. Resources are very, very tight. They're hard to get. Uh, it's it's 
incredible. I really, really love it. Uh, give Crown of Amara a try if this seems like a game for you if you're just a Euro gamer like we are. Um, it's it's freaking incredible. I really like it a lot. So Crown of Amara, really great game. Thanks again, Crook, for getting that for my birthday. Nagaraja. This is got a great insert. It doesn't hold stuff vertically. This, fine. This way, nah. The box explodes every single time. I don't want to open it, but it was already like that. I can't even close it now. Whatever. Nagaraja. I'm, I'm all over the place today. Nagaraja is a uh, Bruno Catala and Theo Riv Riviere um, game. Uh, Bruno Catala is our favorite designer, so we're instantly at Gen Con like, yeah, we got to pick that one up. But it's got Vincent Detroit art, and it's actually a two-player only game. So we're like, a two-player only game by Bruno Catala? Insta-buy. And we're glad we did, because it is a really, really good game. It's kind of got an Indiana Jones-type theme, where you essentially are going... It's like that scene from uh, uh, Ace Ventura, where he's delivering the package. He's like, sounds broken. He's like, most likely, sir. That's how I feel like when I do that. But nonetheless, you have your own little um, temple here. It's blank and you're essentially bidding on these different tiles, kind of like Carcassonne or Karuba tiles that have a bunch of different paths going in different ways. And then you're gonna, if you win those tiles, you're gonna place it in your temple and you're then essentially building paths around your temple. You're exploring the temple and trying to get your paths to match up to the sides of the board. The sides of the board are these little kind of dome shape tiles. And on the other side of those tiles, there's gonna be points. So if you can get a, uh, a path from one of your entrances, which is on this side, to that, and that that um, pathway that goes to the scoring tiles goes back to your doors, you then get to flip it over and see how much it is. And the scoring tiles can either be three, four, five, or six. And basically, um, if you get to 25 points, you automatically win. You just immediately win, that's how you win the game. But on the side here, there are two, uh, Three Cursed Relics. Cursed Relics are the ones that are worth six. They're very, very nice because six points is a lot. So if you uncover two Cursed Relics, you're okay. But if you ever, ever uncover all three of your Cursed Relics, you also immediately lose. So if you get 25 points, you immediately win. If you uncover all your Cursed Relics, you immediately lose. But they're worth more. So you're kind of pushing your luck in terms of trying to uncover one. Because you already have two that are uncovered. You're like, oh gosh, where's the other one? And you can end up screwing yourself over like that. And it's very, very fun. So the game is played through these cards. These cards, um, you'll play down and you'll roll these sticks. These sticks are essentially D4s, except for they roll better. On the side of the sticks, there'll be either uh, pips or there'll be a thing called, um, they're called nagas. And they are the swirly kind of, they look like a swirly like this. And basically, you play a certain amount of cards and that'll determine how many uh, sticks you get to roll. And then you roll out those sticks. The sticks with the pips are the ones that you use to get the tile, because only one person get the tile. If you have more pips the, than your opponent, you will win the tile. And then if you roll the little squiggly snakes, that allows you to play cards for actions. And the actions can do a whole bunch of different stuff. One, it can get you more pips, so you have a better chance of winning the tile. They can allow you to peek at one of the scoring opportunities around the side, so you can kind of look at it like, ooh, that's a cursed relic, I already have two out, let's never, ever, ever go here. You can decide to swap things, you can do a little bit of mean stuff to your opponent, not very much though, but nonetheless, you're getting the pips to try to win these tiles, but then you're also trying to get the squiggly snakes so that you can play these cards for actions. All the cards are multi-use, and it's really fun. It's not very heavy, it's pretty It's pretty light in terms of like rules and stuff, but there's a lot of tactical strategy going on in trying to bid and get the tiles that you need to get all of these different things uncovered. It's really, really fun. Kind of got under the radar, um, unfortunately, but it's Bruno Catala. Vincent Dutrait are the arts really, really pretty. Two player game by Hurricane Games. Uh, it's really good. The insert doesn't hold things when it's vertical though. All right, two more and I'll get out of here, I promise. A Heil. I like A Heil a lot. Um, a Heil is a game by Amiibo and Pandasaurus Games that came out this year. I think it came out of Origins. I, I think that's where it had its US release date, I believe. But, um, I has got this really, really cool art uh, that for me feels like Sunday morning like comics in your paper, like Sunday morning comic paper. Nick, Sunday morning newspaper that has the comic section. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking good today. But essentially this game is kind of like Tetris where everyone will have their own board and it feels more Tetris-y than something like Baron Park. Baron Park has polyomino tiles like Tetris, but it doesn't feel Tetris-y at all aside from the fact that you're trying to match these 
tiles together. But this one very much does feel like Tetris. There is a pavilion in the middle that has these different cards that have Tetris shapes on them. And on your turn, you can either draft a card and then get that tile, or you can turn the carousel. Now, why you'd want to turn the carousel is when you draft a card, like say I draft this, this uh, L piece, the L piece is like this, yellow L piece, that piece I cannot rotate as it comes into my, my party here. So it'll go like, do, 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 like Tetris all the way down in the, into my party. So if I want it in a different orientation, I'll have to spend an action point to turn the carousel and then I can draft it because now it's in a different orientation. And so it really feels Tetrisy in that way. And essentially you're trying to make different groups of colors of um, tiles in your party here. And then depending on different things, you can get extra visitors, you can get like the hot couple that comes to your party and stuff like that. But it's ultimately pretty darn simple. I mean, it's really... Honestly, it's basically gateway level. I could say this, you could definitely teach this as a gateway game, especially if you're a good teacher. And it's very fun because it's got a very normal theme for people. Like, hey, it's kind of like Tetris. Like, you know Tetris? You go like, ding, 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 and people can understand that. And then the rest of the rules you kind of just teach normally. And it, it's a very, very fun game that uh, I hope does well because I really, really love it. I love the kind of weird uh, Sunday cartoon art. It's really, really cool. And it's a very, very fun Tetris style game. I like Ohio a lot. And by the way, Ohio is a, um, a Portuguese a block party. That's what Ohio means. Last, but definitely not least, def definitely not least, uh, that sounded like I didn't like any of these games, I like all those games, is Evolution. Evolution is, that's incredible. I love it so much. I love Evolution. Evolution is about, weirdly enough, um, the Inquisition. No, it's about Evolution, uh, as you didn't know. And it's got some of my favorite art in the whole world in it. Uh, check out our top 10 uh, board game art video because we talk about this game a bit in that. Um, but this is a game that that uh, represents evolution. You are essentially, in this version right here, you're gonna get a different species. The species are essentially blank species. Uh, and they will track your body size, like how big of a species are you. Are you like a rodent? Are you like an elephant? Um, and it'll also track how big your population is. And basically what you wanna do is you wanna have the biggest population because every round you will end up eating food equal to your population. So there's gonna be a bunch of food in this watering hole. All this here is food. And um, you'll be putting food in the watering hole and then you'll go species by species around and around and around around the table. And each turn it comes to you, you'll get to eat a food. And they'll go to the next person, they eat a food. And you keep going until everything, everyone is fed or you run out of food. And so essentially, the bigger your population, the more food you get to eat. If you have five population, you get to eat five food unless it runs out, of course. And at the end of the game, whoever ate the most food wins. So really, it's just about eating food, which is kind of cool because it makes sense. It's like if you were able to eat enough food, that means your species was able to survive. Now, on top of that, there's all these different cards. These are all different traits that your species can have. Because right now, like this, it's just a blank species. It has nothing. But you can give your species horns. You can turn them into a carnivore. You can give them like a hard shell to protect against carnivores. You can make them fertile. You can have them be foraging. You can give them a very long neck like a dinosaur so they can eat food. And all these different traits give you certain things that make you better at surviving. Whether surviving means defending against predators and carnivores, because once you turn into a carnivore, you no longer grab food from the watering hole, you get food from other species and you attack the other species and it's super, super cool. But then you have to constantly adapt and the cool thing is, is you can take traits off your animals at any time. If you're like, you know what, I don't need horns anymore, there's no predators around, I don't really need them, I would like to have a long neck instead, boom, you can swap those out and that is you changing over time, that is you evolving. And there's been a lot of scientists that have actually said that this game more accurately represents evolution than like any other game. Because essentially you're just trying stuff out. Different mutations happen. You put a new trait on there. You go, is this useful? It's useful now, but you know, a couple rounds later, ah, this is really not useful anymore. So it changes. That's how evolution works. It's very, very cool. Now inside this box, this is not the evolution climate box, but there was a standalone expansion called evolution climate that came out. Climate is in here as well. Evolution Climate introduces one more cards and more traits, but it also introduces the environment and the climate. It gets hotter, it gets colder throughout the game, it swings kind of wildly between, between uh, the temperatures, and Evolution Climate is the only way to play Evolution. If you're gonna get Evolution, get Evolution Climate. It is so, so much better with climate. The climate adds so much more, and it's, it's just another thing to think about 
And it's just so cool because, again, it's accurate. Like, as it gets colder, smaller animals start dying off. As it gets cool, colder, the bigger your body size, the more able your um, species is to survive. But the opposite is also true. As it gets hotter and hotter and hotter, the bigger animals start dying off because it gets harder for the, it's harder for them to regulate their body temperature. And it's just so, so cool. And then there's cool events that can happen, like meteors can hit, and like there can be a giant fire. You can be in the middle of a hot area, but then there's a cold snap, so all of a sudden for one turn, it just gets super cold all of a sudden, and then it goes back to being hot. It's just wild and fun, and I really, really love evolution. And honestly, evolution is pretty easy to learn. There's not much to learn in the game. The card combinations take a little bit of learning to do, but like, honestly, this is about, a, it's a hair above gateway level. I really think uh, you could teach this game, especially the base game, to pretty new people. And it is so, so gorgeous. God, look at this weird lizard man. Oh, it's amazing. Evolution is great. I really, really love it. I think it's an incredible game um, that, uh, I'm glad they've supported with the climate and now they have Evolution Oceans, which is evolution that takes place in the water, which uh, we, I think, are, are getting soon and I really, really want to try it. But nonetheless, this shelf is empty now. And so there's no more games to talk about. Don't look at these ones. I don't want to talk about those ones. Those ones suck. Um, no. But nonetheless, that is this shelf right here. Um, do, us, do me a favor. Send us a shelfie on, on social media. Hit us up on Twitter or Instagram. Or something. Hit, hit us up with a shelfie. Tag us in. I want to see your shelves. Um, I really like the What's in the Shelf series because it's just fun to kind of sit down and just talk about games um, because we don't get to do that very often because we don't really do reviews here. And so it's nice to kind of just sit down and, and, and chat. And this one I actually am sitting down. It's, it's been nice to kind of just hang out next to the wall over here. Um, nonetheless, uh, I hope you all enjoyed this. Down in the comments below, let me know what of these games you've played, what you've enjoyed, what you didn't enjoy, and maybe what games of this stack you would want to play. Again, don't worry about these stacks. We'll get to them later. Um, but nonetheless... Uh, hit us up down in the comments below. Make sure to give this video a thumbs up, give it a share, and hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. If you really, really, really love what we do, consider supporting us on Patreon. Until next time, we'll move on to a different shelf, and uh, we'll see you later. Have a great day.